Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Everyone's got that one movie that really formed who they were as a film, are as a film fan, excuse me. And one of ours just came out on Blu-ray. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I am the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming you do because you're listening right now, you can subscribe to the podcast. Uh, You can find us over at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there, we'd really appreciate it. Also, you can follow us on the social media, as the kids call it. You can find us over at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, Facebook and Instagram are still working, of course, but Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either In the Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please come by where it all began over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of the moving image. We talk film, we talk television, we love writing about it and talking about it, and we love it when you come read about it. So please come and stop on by. On this episode, uh, this is a bucket list one. I, uh, I really had fun with this one. We got to talk with writer-director Jonathan Mostow about his film Breakdown. Yeah, we're talking Breakdown today. The Back in 1997 with, uh, with Kurt Russell and running down the highway chasing bad guys and being chased by bad guys. and it's It was a little indie film that you know got picked up by a studio and it just... It, it had this life of its own, and I mean, I remember as a younger film fan, people would always talk, hey, did you ever see Breakdown? You heard about Breakdown? I mean, I, I was lucky enough that I got to see this in the theaters, but uh, Breakdown is always one of those movies that has had a life, even long after it got released, and uh, it just got, well, it just got re-released on Blu-ray for the very first time here in North America uh, from our friends over at Paramount Pictures Home Entertainment, and it is a... It is a fantastic disc, and we got the chance to talk with Jonathan about uh, not just the movie, but its legacy and sort of how it evolved over the years, and so very much more. It was a fantastic talk, and it was a a fun one, so I hope you enjoy it, because I know that I did. Well, Jonathan, first off, thank you so much for the time today. I appreciate this. My my pleasure. You are you're in a city I talk about a lot because I, I've never I, I'm embarrassed to say I've never been there. Really? I've, I've always I know there's so much film production there, but I've never been there. I've always wanted to go. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, so I, I hope uh, hope I get there soon. Well, we hope so, too. No, I mean, obviously, we're talking breakdown today. And I mean, I will disclose it is a personal favorite of mine. I have always loved that movie. I guess my first question for you is walk me through, I guess, the origin of the story, because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. This was like your first or your second like feature length job. Yeah, this was well, this was my first quote unquote real movie. It was my first theatrical movie. Um, I I had done one and a half tiny movies prior to that. and um, so I was, uh, and, and originally I envisioned Breakdown being like my big $4 million epic movie that was going to be a giant leap up for me. And so uh, when it turned into like a studio size movie with like the movie star being flown by private jet <laughs> <laughs> from his house in Los Angeles to a location in Utah and Nevada and stuff, I was, I was kind of sort of taken aback. Um, and, uh, but the genesis of the movie was I'd been working with Martha and Dino De Laurentiis, the producers, on a, a totally different movie. It was a kind of a horror movie based on a Stephen King short story. And uh, we had already scouted locations and, and things like that. And we had a script. And then, and then in sort of early pre production, the movie fell apart because there was a contractual problem with the Stephen King people, et cetera. And so, I suddenly was like, oh my gosh, I don't have a movie to make. And I needed to make a film. It had been, it had been a while. And so I w- was thinking, okay, how can I salvage the situation? Uh, I know about these locations in the, in the desert. I sort of had this image of this trucks in my head. 
And so I came up with a completely different story that had nothing to do with the Stephen King plot or anything, characters, anything like that. And I, and I quickly wrote a screenplay and I bought it back to the De Laurentiis and I said, how about we do this instead? And, and thankfully they were like, they read it and they're like, oh yeah, okay, well, let's do this. And that, that's how it came about. So even though this movie has nothing to do with Stephen King, I, I've always felt like I owe a, a, a debt to Stephen King because I, I think without that sort of circuitous uh, path, I would have even had, you know, been th- had those ingredients in my head to, to think about this. No, I mean, talk to me a little bit about Kurt because I mean, obviously audiences are used to seeing him with, a, with an eye patch and a leather trench coat, but he makes it work in khakis in this. He's so great in this film. Yeah, I, I think Kurt's one of the great film actors of, of all time. And the reason is because he has this gift to be able to sort of just pull you in with him and just empathize with him. And, and he does it because he understands like how to make you think you understand what he's thinking just with his behavior, with no, with no dialogue. Um, and, you know, there's a certain category of moviegoer that... You say Kurt Russell and they think of, yeah, they think of Snake Plissken with the, with the eye patch. There's a, there's a whole other demographic that you say Kurt Russell and they think of him in his light comedies, like, you know, uh, sure. um, Captain Ron or Overboard or the, <laughs> something, right? So, so he's, he's kind of unique in that he is, works across all genres and he's just, he's just a phenomenal actor. So uh, he had perhaps not played quite this sort of average Joe sort of character. Yeah. Um, and and I think that it, it was actually, I, I know because he, he said after a couple of months of filming, he, he said to me, you know, it's, it's like I'm in pain. I'm in physical pain shooting this film. I've done harder films with bigger stunts and harder things, but I'm in physical pain shooting this film. And I realize it's because I'm playing this character that's racked with anxiety. And I've never, that I've never done before. And for him, who's the opposite of an anxious guy, uh, playing somebody with like their shoulders hunched up was was literally causing him, you know, muscular pain. That's amazing. Now, I mean, obviously for a film like this with the good guy with Kurt, you've got to have the bad guy. And I mean, JT, I mean, sadly, he's no longer with us, but he, he was he was so good in this film. Like, can you talk to me a little bit? Just I could imagine a lot of your job was probably in the casting process before you even got to Utah to shoot. Yeah, uh, J.T. Walsh was just the definition of a, of a character actor. And that's somebody who just disappears into the role. So much so that when you see him in other movies, your first thought is, oh God, I forgot he was in that movie. And I forgot he was in Good Morning Vietnam. I forgot he was in The Big Picture. I forgot he was in Tequila Sunrise. And uh, J.T. actually came in and auditioned for me. And 20 seconds into the audition, I just knew that's the guy. And interestingly enough, um, like the next day, I happened to be talking to Kurt and Kurt said, you know, I, I know who should play that part. And, and I said, well, actually, you know, funny you should mention, somebody just came in and, and that's the guy, I, it, it's, I think they're perfect for it. And, and Kurt's like, okay, well, you say the name you're thinking of and I'll say the name that I think it should be. And I said, JT Walsh and Kurt was like, it's like jaw drop. He's like, that's who I was going to suggest. So, so uh, cause Kurt had actually worked with them three times before and knew what JT bought to the table. Now, I mean, obviously I remember seeing this film in theater and I mean, again, absolutely loving it. And I mean, it did well. And then it came out on VHS and then DVD and Blu-ray now Blu-ray, obviously it's always one of those films that's kind of bubbled under the surface. Like for years, whenever I've talked to film friends, it's like, oh, have you seen Breakdown? Oh, yeah, that movie's great. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always the one that is sort of like, it's never gone away. It's always kind of had legs. I'm kind of curious, from your standpoint, how what's more rewarding, sort of that initial burst of success when you open something, or having something that sort of has legs and sustains? Well, look, from, from a career standpoint in Hollywood, where the obsession is what was opening weekend and right. all that stuff. Yeah. You know, it opened number one, and it, it really launched my career in a, in a in a great way. So uh, that was, from a practical standpoint, uh, selfishly, obviously that that was great. Um, I, you know, but 
the longevity of the film has been really gratifying. I, 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 I think the comment that, that I appreciate most is when people say, as, as you just did, I remember seeing it in the theater because I remember seeing certain films in the theater and those are the ones that really stuck with me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so to be in that, in that category of films really, uh, I, I think ultimately that's the goal. Uh, Barbara Streisand, weird for me to bring up her name perhaps in this context, but um, some years ago, I remember she won like, maybe it was like a Lifetime Achievement Award. I can't remember where it was. And she gave this speech and she said something was just great. She said, you know, it, it's terrific to receive these awards and whatever, but the thing that really matters, the real question is 30 years from now, 20 years from now, do these films hold up, you know? And as we know, not that many films hold up over that amount of time. So, um, uh, so that's always been, whenever I'm making a film, my hope that, you know what, many years from now, is this still going to work? And it's, it's, I don't even know what it is that, that is, distinguishes those films that work that, that from, from those that don't. Um, but I, I've always been gratified that, that Breakdown still seems to have an audience. And in fact, when, when, the, when it was announced like uh, last month or two months ago that you could even pre-order the, the Blu-ray, it shot up to number one on Amazon. <laughs> like, it surprised, surprised me, surprised even the studio. Like they, they had not had that happen before. So, um, uh, so, so hopefully I'm, I'm hoping fans of the film will, will get to enjoy all the cool new stuff that's on the Blu-ray and maybe people who never, <laughs> people who never saw the film before will, will get a chance to see, uh, you know, a nice uh, presentation of it. And you know what? It really does feel timeless because it's one of those films that feels like it could have been made during any era. And we're not getting those kind of films now, especially out of the studio system where it's you know got to be world building and 300 million and all that kind of stuff. This, in, you know, as much as it's a studio film, almost feels very indie in the same way. I mean, I, I'm kind of curious, like from your perspective, someone who's sort of in the system, why do you think we've lost focus on maybe making smaller movies as opposed to trying to make sort of the, the ginormous blockbusters? Yeah. Well, well, it, it, by the way, it was an independent movie. In fact, all but one of my films have been independently financed movies. Right. Um, so uh, what's great about that, the reason I, I love that way of making a film is the studio isn't in there nervously uh, making fear-based decisions right. and, and pushing you to make fear-based decisions. You just kind of go make the movie you want to make. Um, and, uh, you know, it comes to answer your question, it comes down to marketing. It's so expensive to market a movie that whether you make a movie for, you know, $20 million or $200 million, you still have to spend at least a hundred worldwide. Right. If you really want to open it. So it, it's, it's, I understand why it makes more financial sense for studio to just focus on, on the big tentpole movies. And, you know, the only thing that, that is going to perhaps rescue this sort of category of, of sort of more modestly priced films is, is streaming, you know, is that, that the streamers can make these kind of films and not worry about meeting that threshold of something right. that's going to get people to go get the babysitter and the parking and the popcorn and, you know, spend $150 to basically take your family out to the movies. So, um, so, so that's, that's it. And, but and even in its day, breakdown was hard. Every studio passed on breakdown. It only got made because, Dino and Martha De Laurentiis, you know, started filming using their own money, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then and then Paramount came in after we had already started. started oh, okay, filming. okay. But you know what, man? I mean, that's it for me. But just thank you for the work and thank you for for making a piece of cinema that will proudly sit on my shelf and a lot of people's shelves for years after we're gone. Because again, it's probably one of my favorite movies of all time. I absolutely love it. Well, well, now you're one of my favorite journalists. Of all time. <laughs> <laughs> very, kind of very, very kind of you. Thank you. All right, cheers. Thanks for the time, Jonathan. Absolutely, thank you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and 
and Blu-ray needs.